Last weekend was a difficult one for our parish. For some of you, it was particularly difficult. We've had a week now to process some of our thoughts, some of our emotions, begin to sign up for feedback sessions, and to perhaps go back and listen to both Archbishop Dunn's homily on our universal call to holiness and to his address at the end of Mass, which situated his announcement in how Pope Francis, Archbishop Mancini, and now he, as our next Archbishop, are trying to lead the church, trying to lead this diocese, directing our resources for the evangelization of today's world, which is no easy task. It's brutal to consider where we are now as a parish compared to decades past. I find this brutal. This is not fun at all. It's numbing to hear negative vital statistics like those that were rhymed off by our Archbishop last week. It's challenging, to say the least, to consider a future that possibly involves the closing of two of our church buildings in which the gospel has been proclaimed. Christ has been encountered. Sacraments have been celebrated and hope has been kindled. We're not alone in considering such things. Every new parish across this diocese has been asked to do this kind of thing. Right across the Western world, dioceses and parishes are grappling with similar issues, trying to figure out what to do. But let me tell you, if there is no dream for the future, if there is no plan to accompany that dream, if all hope is lost, if we're numb to inaction by the kind of statistics that were shared with us last week by the Archbishop, there's no point in even engaging in a process of restructuring at all. And that numbness will prevail and win. If we close church buildings without a hope-filled vision for our future, we will simply find ourselves closing more church buildings 15 years from now. And again, and again, until the last church closes in this archdiocese at some point. But we do have a dream, and we do have a plan, both as an archdiocese and here as a parish. This new parish's Stronger Together process is fundamentally about making that dream possible. I encourage you, if you have not heard the Archbishop speak at the Assembly of the People of God yesterday. I encourage you to go and find that and listen to what they have to say. Now, whether we have hope or whether we don't is a matter for each of us to consider. Hope like a tree can grow or can wither depending on the soil it grows from. We must ask ourselves, what is our hope rooted in? Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7, that unless our foundation is him, we're rooted in shifting sands. And rooting ourselves and rooting our hope in Jesus likewise means rooting ourselves in his cross. But confident in his grace, confident in new life, confident in the resurrection that comes, that springs from it. I've often wondered about the apostles after Jesus died on the cross. Maybe you have as well. What they were thinking. What they were feeling. Those three days that Jesus was in the tomb. What about us? Some of us can still remember when our parishes were thriving. Some of us can remember a church in the Western world that didn't seem to be on the ropes. Some of us remember it well because it's lived experience. In much the same way that the disciples remembered the wedding feast at Cana, the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, the Sermon on the Mount, that was lived experience. And as Jesus underwent his passion, 
And as we experience a church in decline in the Western world, did that hope and does our hope begin to disappear? As Christians, we're well experienced with small deaths and resurrections lived out in our lives. We recall the cross and resurrection often. In fact, we celebrate what we recall right here at Mass. We live it out in our lives, both embracing the crosses that come our way and rejoicing in new life as we experience Christ. But sometimes, sometimes when that cross is very heavy and the prospect of new life and resurrection can seem somewhat diminished, we can lose heart. And when that happens, it's tempting to check out or to fight to keep things the way they've always been or to recreate a glorious past. And our challenge as a parish is to remember and celebrate what God has done in our midst. But also, as St. John Paul II challenged us, to commit all of the church's energies to a new evangelization. Or as Pope Francis has more recently challenged us and was shared last week, to reevaluate our times and schedules, languages and structures to be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world. Now, we can reasonably disagree on how to do these things. There might be multiple pathways forward in the wider archdiocese or right here at our local parish. For us, though, what was clear from the work of the pastoral council, the leadership team, and the working group is that we had to do something. We had to do something different, whatever that might be. We've also gained clarity around our purpose. What's not up for debate is what we're supposed to do as a parish at the most fundamental level. That's defined by Jesus himself. It's underscored by the Pope, our archbishops, and for what it's worth, myself. Because as a church, we don't just have a mission, we are a mission. And living that out is our number one priority. So we can disagree on how we're going to do that, but we can't disagree on the fact that we are going to do that. Failure to embrace our missionary identity as a church is to lose the essence of who we are, to become almost unrecognizable as the church that Jesus founded. And don't we encounter that today in the parable of the bridesmaids? Don't we hear the Lord saying at the end of this parable, I do not know you. I do not recognize you. I cringe hearing those words. I hope you do as well. I instinctively rebel against those words because there's such a finality to them. Terrible. I want to cry out, no, Lord. You know me. You know who I am. I know who you are. I want to be with you forever. And so the question comes back to us. Jesus asks us the question today. Do we have oil in our lamps? An oil of hope. As a parish, is it evident that preparing for the bridegroom's return is a priority, the priority? As individual believers, is it evidence that we still hope he's going to return at all? I hope we can give a resounding yes to those questions. And if so, are we committed to knowing Jesus and making him known above all else? So questions worth reflecting on at any time, but especially in this time. There is a future worth chasing because Jesus is still Lord. There is a dream worth pursuing because Jesus is still the chief shepherd of this church. There is hope because Jesus lives and because he is entrusted to his church and to our parish, in fact, his mission. There are resources because he has poured out his Holy Spirit upon us. Through our baptism, we have been endowed with charisms, with spiritual gifts for building up his church. And if we unite around our mission and embrace a hope-filled vision and work closer together than ever before, reliant on the Holy Spirit, we can see new life. My friends, I invite you to pray. I invite you to pray for our parish. I invite you to fast for our parish. And I do invite you to share with us your thoughts and feelings around the proposal for our parish in a feedback session. Regardless of how we end up structuring ourselves, I invite you to commit yourselves to our mission, to our vision, because that's fundamental 
no matter how many churches we have. Let's ensure we have an oil of hope in our lamps so that Jesus will say, I know you, come and enjoy the wedding banquet.